All right, I guess we're started here. Um, we're going to look, pick up right where we left off. Recall that we were looking at the political core of this book, what I consider to be the political core, which is the banana company's invasion into Macondo, which is no longer the Edenic, utopic world, but nonetheless is still uh, more or less on an even keel. And then we saw that very famous scene where um, Mr. Brown comes in, oh no, Mr. Herbert comes in and tastes one of the bananas. And that final punchline, that's what we get for giving a banana to a gringo. Uh, that's, I, I love the scene of him measuring and weighing and <laughs> taking the temperature of the room and the humidity of the room, this kind of scientific uh, commercialism. But we haven't gotten to the Banana Company massacre, where the workers strike, as you all remember now, since you've all read the book. Um, and that scene where one of the Buen Dias, well, two participate and one lives to tell the tale, despite the official burying, the official invisibilizing of this massacre of workers. So that's what I want to look at first, and then I want to go to the end and answer my own question and Brent's in the quiz, which is what does all of this have to do with the fact that the novel ends in a whirlwind, a hurricane, a prophetic wind, as we're told, that blows this, the town away. I think they're very closely connected. Remember the flood comes after the banana company's massacre of the workers. The town folds its arms, we're told, and waits to die. So I think this novel is, is a very strong political critique as much as it is also magical. And indeed, remember I've said sometimes the more magical, the more political, because the more hallucinatory the scene, the more terrible the, the, the abuses, the, the more Garcia Marquez removes us in a sense and mythologizes the evil. So we're going to look at the scene that for me is key to that formula, the more hallucinatory, the more political uh, the novel becomes. So let's go to the beginning of the chapter, which in the new volume is 312, no, 315, and in the old is 272. This chapter starts with the announcement of 315 in the new, 372 in the old. And William, you're on your own. It's the beginning of the, it's, it's the, you get, very good, excellent. It starts and it tells us exactly, we've said all along that this temporal structure is fatalistic. Things are destined. When you have that retrospective future, he would remember many years later something would occur. We have a sense of destiny, of fatality. It's not as if we wonder what's going to happen. We're told it's already been decided. So we have what, what we know now as Melchiades, this omniscient narrator who both predicts and remembers the hundred years of solitude. So we get the events that would deal Macondo, its final blow, were just showing themselves when they brought Meme Boindia's son home. Very explicit, the events that would deal Macondo its fatal blow. And then two pages into this novel, we'll forget for a moment about um, Meme's son, although he's going to be important because he's the one, Aureliano, who witnesses the massacre and as a child on the, the shoulders of Jose Arcadio Segundo. So, but for the, for the moment, turn now, we're going to just, so, so that's announced in the beginning of this chapter. Now turn, it's about six pages in, 322 in the new and 378 in the old. We start now to see trouble brewing. It's like an eruption that's waiting to happen because of the terrible conditions of the workers. The exploitation of what was and was United Fruit in this area of Colombia and in other areas of uh, Latin America as well. 
So we were told it's the banana company. And I'm just going to call your attention, and we're going to go skipping through about four pages and look at passages where all of this comes to a head at that moment when the, the government troops opened fire on the people in the plaza of Macondo. So we're, we see the new Aureliano was a year old when the tension of the people broke with no forewarning. Jose Arcadio Segundo and other union leaders who had remained underground until then suddenly appeared one weekend and organized demonstrations in town throughout the banana region. Uh-oh, the workers aren't <coughs> happy with their treatment. The police merely maintained public order, but on Monday night the leaders were taken from their homes and sent to jail in the capital of the province with two pound irons on their legs. Okay, skip about six lines more and the sentence they stated furthermore, they stated furthermore that they were not being paid in real money. This is part of the complaints of the workers. But in scrip, which was good only to buy Virginia ham in the company commissaries. Jose Arcadio Segundo, and that's kind of funny in a way, Virginia hams, well, it's not funny in any real political terms. They're paid, but only with money that will buy something that they don't need from the company that's paying them in the first place. Jose Arcadio Segundo was put in jail because he revealed that the script system was a way for the company to finance its fruit ships, which without the commissary merchandise would have to return empty from New Orleans to the banana ports. The other complaints were common knowledge. The company physician did not examine the sick, but had them line up behind one another in the dispensaries, and a nurse would take, put a pill the color of copper sulfate on their tongues, whether they had malaria, gonorrhea, or constipation. It was a cure that was so common that children would stand in line several times and instead of swallowing the pills, would take them home to use as bingo markers. Again, that marvelous way of Garcia Marquez making funny what is a terrible abuse. The company workers were, crowned to, were crowded together in miserable barracks. The engineers, instead of putting in toilets, had a portable latrine for every 50 people brought to the camps at Christmas time, and they held public demonstrations of how to use them so they would last longer. The decrepit lawyers, dressed in black, who during other times had besieged Colonel Aureliano Buendia and who were now controlled by the banana company, dismissed these, those demands with decisions that seemed like acts of magic. Look at that. That's perfect Garcia Marquez, with terrible decisions that seemed like acts of magic. So ridiculous is it, so unfair, so slight of handish, so, so deceptive that it seems like magic. When the workers drew up a list of unanimous a list of unanimous petitions a long time passed before they were able to notify the ban banana company officially. And then there's this marvelous point, marvelous part where Mr. Brown suddenly disappears. Again, this sleight of hand, this fellow who's run the banana company suddenly turns up. Let's just read it. It's very funny. It's just about the official denial of wrongdoing. We're all very familiar with it in other worlds that we, that world that we occupy today, but this is done again in a kind of comic way that makes it the more trenchant, at least so I think. I'm interested whether you find it to be so. As soon as he found out about the agreement, Mr. Brown hitched his luxurious glassed-in coach to the train and disappeared from Macondo along with the more prominent representatives of his company. Nonetheless, some workers found him, found one of them the following Sunday in a brothel, and they made him sign a copy of the sheet with the demands while he was naked with the women who had helped to entrap him. We won't go on about that. Well, just go down later on. Go skip one sentence. This is very funny, really. Later on, Mr. Brown was surprised traveling incognito in a third-class coach, and they made him sign another copy of the demands. On the following day, he appeared before the judges with his hair dyed black and speaking flawless Spanish. Ah, it should happen to all of us. <laughs> the lawyers showed that the man was not Mr. Jack Brown, the superintendent of the banana company born in Prattville, Alabama. That 
again, one of the specific details why Prattville, Alabama, no reason, but a harmless vendor of medicinal plants born in Macondo and baptized there with the name of Dagoberto Fonseca. A little while later, a while later, faced with a new attempt by workers, the lawyers publicly exhibited Mr. Brown's death certificate, attested to by consuls and foreign ministers, which bore witness that on June 9th last, he had been run over by a fire engine in Chicago. Um, again, that kind of the, the specific details that make us smile. Here, a great, that last sentence, a great example of hyperbole asserted by consuls and attested to by consuls and foreign ministers. Just tossed in there. Oh yeah, right. Consuls and foreign ministers. Well, it, it's, it's typical Garcia Marquez. Um, all right, go down to the next paragraph when things get serious. A great, the great strike broke out. Cultivation stopped halfway, the fruit rotted on the trees, and 120, and 120 cart trains remained on the sidings. The idle workers overflowed the towns. The Street of the Turks echoed with a Saturday that lasted for several days. One more half sentence that you just say, that's Garcia Marquez, a Saturday that lasted for several days. It means they didn't go to work. So there was a kind of party, if you want. Guys off work. So it's like Saturday again and again. And in the pool room of the Hotel Jacob, they had to arrange 24-hour shifts. That was where Jose Arcadio Segundo was on the day it was announced that the army had been assigned to reestablish public order. Now, I'm not going to read the rest of the sent this paragraph. You will remember it. But basically, the American company gets the Colombian government to send in troops. And this is when things get even worse. Bottom of page 325, that next paragraph that begins, martial law enabled the army to assume the functions of arbitrator in the controversy, but no effort at conciliation was made. When you have the army being the mediators, you know you're in trouble. As soon as they appeared in Macondo, the soldiers put aside their rifles and cut and loaded the bananas and started the trains running. The workers who had been content to wait until then went into the woods with no other weapons but their working machetes and they began to sabotage the sabotage. <coughs> they burned plantations and commissaries, tore up tracks to impede the passage of the trains that began to open their path with machine gun fire and they cut telegraph and telephone wires and so forth. Now the, the paragraph we're headed for is the following one and we will read all of it. Jose Arcadio Segundo was in the crowd that had gathered at the station on Friday since early morning. He had taken part, I'm sorry, it isn't this paragraph. Let's, let's skip this one. I want to go to the one where the machine guns start to fire, and I will do that now. 281, I'm going to use my old, old copy. It's the paragraph that starts Jose Arcadio Segundo sweating ice. Do you find it? Okay. What page is it in the new version? Thank you. Yes, I looked, overlooked it. The very last line of 327. Jose Arcadio Segundo sweating ice lowered the child. That's the Meme's son who he's holding on his shoulders and gave him to the woman. Those bastards just might shoot, she murmured. Jose Arcadio Segundo did not have time to speak because at that instant he recognized the hoarse voice of Colonel Gavilan echoing the words of the woman with a shout. And then this beautiful, I mean, and horrifying description of being caught in a violent political massacre. I mean, it's hard to imagine for most of us. Intoxicated by the tension, by the miraculous depth of the silence, and furthermore convinced that nothing could move that crowd, held tight in a fascination with death, Jose Arcadio Segundo raised himself up over the heads in front of him, and for the first time in his life he raised his voice. You bastards, he shouted, take the extra minute and stick it up your ass. After his shout, something happened that did not bring on fright, but a kind of hallucination. Here's this magical technique to speak of real horrors. S bring on fright, 
did not bring on fright, but a kind of hallucination. The captain gave the order to fire, and 14 machine guns answered at once. But it all seemed like a farce. It was as if the machine guns had been loaded with caps because their panting rattle could be heard and their incandescent spitting could be seen, but not the slightest reaction was perceived, not a cry, not even a sigh among the compact crowd that seemed petrified by an instantaneous invulnerability. In short, no one can believe it's happening. What? Suddenly, on one side of the station, a cry of death tore open the enchantment. Ah, mother. A seismic voice, a volcanic breath, the roar of a cataclysm broke out in the center of the crowd with a great potential of expansion. Jose Arcadio, buen, sorry, Jose Arcadio Segundo, barely had time to pick up the child while the mother with the other one was swallowed up by the crowd that swirled about in panic. And then brilliant Garcia Marquez, many years later, were pulled out of that scene of horror. Many years later, that child would still tell, in spite of people thinking that he was a crazy old man, how Jose Arcadio Segundo had lifted him up over his head and hauled him almost in the air as if floating on the terror of the crowd toward a nearby street. The child's privileged position allowed him to see at that moment the wild mat, that the wild mass was starting to get to the corner and the row of machine guns opened fire. Several voices shouted at the si same time, get down, get down. <coughs> One more passage that speaks of this giant, gigantic whirlwind, this event. The people in front had already done so, get down, get down swept down by the wave of bullets. The survivors, instead of getting down, tried to go back to the small square, and the panic became a dragon's tail. You see what he does, how he mythologizes this? You know, everybody was running around like crazy, you could say. Or you could say, the panic became a dragon's tail. And if you say the latter, you're very good at taking the specific and mythologizing it. A dragon's tail, not even a snake, a dragon's tail. Suggesting the scariness, suggesting the, but also suggesting the mythic content, the mythic import. Uh, of this scene. And the panic became a dragon's tail as one compact wave ran against another which was moving in the opposite direction toward the other dragon's tail in the street across the way where the machine guns were also firing without cease. They were penned in, swirling about in a gigantic whirlwind that little by little was being reduced to its epicenter as the edges were systematically being cut off all around like an onion being peeled by the insatiable and methodical shears of the machine guns. I don't have to, to we don't have to go on and on about the, about the metaphors operating. How many are there in that sentence? The gigantic whirlwind, the epicenter, which suggests still this whirlwind, as we read and are sorry for our neighbors to the east in Alabama, we think of epicenters and so forth. But then, okay, so that's one, this weather metaphor. But then look, systematically being like an onion being peeled by the insatiable and methodical shears of the machine gun. In, in four lines, he, he's perfectly integrated. It, it doesn't, I mean, you could say, well, that's hyperbole too. Most authors aren't going to give us an onion and some shears and a whirlwind in the same sentence. He can do it, he does it, it works. Alrighty, so I think what we've done here is see this, what we will hear again and well, turn, turn in the old version to 287 and in the new, turn the page and see about the corpses. It's the paragraph that begins, Aureliano Segundo had slept at home, right? In that paragraph, you will remember, that it's six or seven lines down. Do you find it in the new version? It's just one page after, 332. thank you, 330, thank you, 332. Um, if you look at the paragraph that begins, Aureliano Segundo had slept at home, go down six, seven, eight lines, and you'll see a sentence that begins, the night before, everybody there, the night before, he had read an extraordinary proclamation to the nation which said that the workers had left the station and had returned home in peaceful groups. 
The proclamation also stated that the Union leaders with great patriotic spirit had reduced their demands to two points, a reform, re reform of medical service and the building of latrines in the living quarters. Well, this echoes this kind of official lie, this kind of complicity of the government of Colombia, or if we take this as a, a story about Colombian history, which it most certainly is, but it could be about other Latin American countries or other dictatorships generally, the complicity of the, the government with the company against the workers will echo throughout the rest of the novel. Even at the, I mean, toward the very end, we, we, we see that one fellow, Aureliano, who continues to insist that the workers were killed, but there's never an official recognition. So I point to that sentence in particular, and then just go to the, the next paragraph, when the rain stops, he said. You see that whenever we have a nice teeny short little one sentence paragraph, it's easy to find because usually it's the opposite, many very long paragraphs. When the rain stops, he said, as long as the rain lasts, we're suspending all activities and then we see. So the banana company hurricane <laughs> is the fuse, let's say, on that the rest of the life that ends in the prophetic uh, wind that takes. What's interesting here, and we'll see it again in Isabel Allende's The House of the Spirits, which is about the coming on of the dictatorship of Pinochet in the late 70s in Chile, though again the word Chile is never mentioned, the word Colombia is certainly not mentioned here, what we know is that this is historically grounded. We know that there was a massacre of workers in a town called Cienaga del Mar. Cienaga, if you speak Spanish, you know means swamp. Cienaga del Mar, swamp of the sea. Um, kind of poetic really, but Cienaga, uh, near Aracataca, the town that Garcia Marquez grew up in until the age of 12. Um, Cienaga was a center of United Fruit. The same year that he was born, 1928, there was a, a massacre. When I teach this, and in fact I'm doing so in another class at the moment, that I cross list with history, and we call it Latin American history through the novel, we spend more time and pay more attention to the historical context of this century of terrible violence that Colombia has experienced. We aren't going to spend so much time on that because if we do, we won't have time for other things. But I will say that all of those civil wars that are fought off stage that Colonel Aureliano Buendia fights and um, is it he loses them all or wins them all, it doesn't matter, uh, does correspond <coughs> to a war in the early part of the century. 1949 is a, a terrible year for Colombia because a presidential hopeful named Jorge Eliezer Gaitan, a liberal candidate, was murdered in Bogota. That set off 20 years of civil war, maybe I've already talked to you about this, uh, called La Violencia, the violence. And it was, at first, liberals against conservatives. Then it came to be basically a kind of class war, of a civil war. People in Colombia killing each other off for, for um, reasons that were very hard by the time I was living in Colombia in 1966 to, to figure out. By 66 and 67, when I arrived, it was pacified, otherwise they, the U.S. government probably wouldn't have been sending in Peace Corps volunteers. Um, we were supposed to be agents for social change, and after a year, Colombian government asked Peace Corps volunteers to quit being <laughs> agents for social change and do other things. Um, but the fact of the matter is there was about 20 years, let's say 10 or 15, really more, between 1960 and 19, let's say 75, before the drug wars started in Colombia. So Colombia's really had this disastrous century of wars that are internal in a way. We can talk forever about the U.S.'s role in the Colombian drug wars uh, and the U.S.'s problem with consumption of drugs or whatever. I guess I, I don't know enough and don't want to get into that. What I want to say is that this sense of the fatality or the fatalism, this sense of the inevitability of things going badly, even though you start with a utopia, you end with an apocalypse, there is something that reflects, I think, the political um, sense of a kind of 
It's the opposite of up by your own bootstraps. There's a sense of resignation, folding your arms and waiting for the town to die. Um, I don't mean to say that there aren't people who live in Colombia who don't have regular normal lives, but Colombia's Colombia's political situation has been um, rather more disastrous than some, let's put it that way. Um, when I was in Colombia at the late 60s, the violence had been resolved in part because there was a system of sharing the, presi the presidential elections. It was called the system of paridad, parity, where four years were for the liberals and four years were the conservatives. They, they, they couldn't risk elections because the elections would erupt in violence. So it had been determined, and rather to give stability after these years of violence in the country, to just switch every four years political parties. And that lasted for, for um, I think, into the 70s. And then c came on the drug problems, and those are well known to all of you. But um, so I'd, uh, beyond that, maybe some of you for your web project, if you're interested in Colombia or particularly interested in Garcia Marquez, you might want to write us a nice little web essay with some some background in, about uh, Colombia and how it resonates in this novel. There's there's lots on that subject. There's lots been written about how this novel reflects Colombian history. There's one in book in particular in our library by a, a fellow named Minter, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it's not quite Minter. I'll look Minta. it up. Sorry, Minta. Thank you very much. M-I-N-T-A. That's right. Um, Stephen, isn't his first name, Chris? Stephen, Stephen Minta, uh, um, who writes, who, get, who codes the, the history of Colombia with, with the events of this, this novel. It's so much more effective, in my view, that um, Garcia Marquez makes this a magical history because it generalizes much more easily. If it were more specifically and realistically set, um, the allegory of political abuse would be, I think, less, well, less generally applicable. We'd say, oh, well, that's a Colombian history, whereas he's wanting us to, to see it as a, a larger matter than that, I think. So. Is, now that I've done all the talking, would you, do you have comments about this central section? Brent, are we kind of okay on this, this connection or not? I still disagree. Okay, would you put your little button on and disagree for all of us, please? Thank you. What do you think causes the demise of... Well, I still see it as the magical element. I mean, I understand the political aspirations for writing the book. Yeah. And I see how um, he sets up this kind of fantastic town to get you into it. Yeah. Then throws in the political commentary. But I think in the end, he throws back that magical element into it, because I just reread the ending twice, and um, I don't see anywhere where it talks about the banana company hurricane. And just the way you described it, you said the ending was very apocalyptic. I kept that in the back of my mind, so when yeah. I read the ending, it came off as Malkata's, that, that was his... That was what, the, what tied the novel back together for me. Okay, it well, wasn't I think the political that's resolution, it was that fantastic element that... that ended it for me and gave me closure to it. So I mean, I guess it's okay. just a perspective. Yeah, it is uh, a different perspective, and it's a very interesting one. And I guess I'm perfectly, I, in a way, I'm quite willing to, uh, to accept your reading. So if, I've, if the quiz is an, at issue uh, here. I don't mind about the quiz. Yeah. Yeah, OK, fine. But OK, great. Will you give me, then I'm, I'm going to sort of backstep one time and one bit and say, okay, let's read the ending as a mythic ending, an apocalyptic prescribed ending. But then what do we do with the fact that the town, after this terrible event, folds its arms, decides to die, and all of that? It does seem to me that's got to be taken into, because we see the town at the end, as we will shortly, as a kind of, a, you know, abandoned, desolate, unenergetic. So do we not take the political into account with the mythic? No, I see how the political yeah. drained the magic out of that town. Yeah, okay, that's a good way to put it. Because when they start entering yeah. reality... And people no, you have to push your button. You're making such good points. We want to hear them. <laughs> when people start dying and the banana company comes in, the whole element of, or the whole structure of the story fo changes focus. Yeah. It's more based in reality than it was previous. Yeah. And so I see how that redirects their attention to yeah. almost a capitalist society as opposed to the traditional society they were in before. Yeah. And because they lose that magic, because they give in to contemporary ideas, 
they lose the ability to continue on as a magical society like they were founded. Yeah. And so that... So there is a kind of fulcrum. I, I see that scene of the banana company hurricane as the fulcrum. You know, think of a, think of a, a teeter-totter where it, somehow it's up like that and then there's a way in which it's, it starts to decline. But see, I think that's a very good way to think about it, that the magic gets lost because really even as hallucinatory as that scene is and as beautifully as Garcia Marquez makes us feel it in, on a mythic level, um, there's, it's still that the magic is gone. People now are like this. And then we have, there are some, of course, scenes that are Garcia Marquezian, including the scene I want to look at, Ursula's death scene, which is one of my favorites, where she's like a little doll uh, being played with and so forth. But, so, but let's skip to the end. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. I think they're very good. Yeah, Richard, pu push the button, please. Uh, when you were talking about the banana company hurricane, I had just assumed you meant the four years of rain, ah. but you're talking about the winds at the end? I'm talking about what's called the banana company hurricane. It's called that, that several times in the novel, and we'll find it if, if... So I was just talking about what happens when the banana company comes. So I guess what I meant by banana company hurricane is the banana company's disruption in the terms Brent was just proposing the disruption of a coherent community and ultimately the subversion of that community. That's what I meant by that, Richard. I didn't mean anything more particular, but the phrase is used several times. Did, did that come as a surprise to you, that phrase? I, don't, I just don't remember the phrase. Okay, yeah. Well, next time I use a phrase that you don't remember, especially on a quiz, just raise your hand and say, what are you talking about, at which point I'll tell you. Okay? <laughs> I mean, make sure to ask. Thank you. All righty. Um, let's go to the end here and see how, how all of this works. Go, if you will, in the old volume to 377 and in the new one to 441. We're really now at, in the last dozen pages or so. It's the bottom of the page, that last paragraph on 441. Where our focus now will be on two things, will it not, at the end. It will be, well, three, the desolation of the town. We're told that Aureliano uh, Babylonia, the final Aureliano, Babylon sounding a bit uh, biblical, you know, that, that uh, the horror of Babylon, as she is translated in the King James Version of the Book of Revelation, is one of the signs of the end, of course, standing for the Roman Empire. We could study apocalyptic texts, uh, and especially our, our fabulous Judeo-Christian version of the end, the fabulously literary, um, the Book of Revelation. So, so Babylon here has an echo for those of you who know the Book of Revelation, as it's called in the Protestant Christian canon, or the Book of Apocalypse, as it's called in the Catholic uh, Bible. So, but the, the King James Version, never read another one. Oh, yes, don't. The 1612, one of the great, am I right? No, 16 something. Well, just before Shakespeare's demise comes the King James translation of the Bible, and it's still one of our great poetic books. And in fact, Megan, you were saying you're reading the, the Bible in a course. Is it, didn't you say the whole thing are you reading? In, it, well, push, the button. push the button. What course is There's, that in? Uh, it's a human situation class. Oh, great. I'm s and so what do you mean human sit? That usually is a... It's the introductory classes for the honors Oh, right. But you can't read most of the Bible in that, can you? Mm. You are? You'd be surprised. Oh, really? Because I've, I've taught in the human we sit, as we say, the human situation Race before. Through it. Oh, wow. So. Wow. Yeah, everyone should have that, I think, as we should all have the Koran, no doubt, and the other religious texts, but particularly in a Judeo-Christian culture as this one is, it's very useful to have that most mythic. Mythic in the good sense. Now, don't think I'm making a statement about belief here. I mean mythic as stories and narratives cultures communally believe in. Cultures identify ourselves by certain mythic narratives. So, myth in, in, in the sense of the most important narratives that we tell ourselves, not in the sense of untrue, not at all. Okay, um, so we're looking here at this 
let's say the setting is, is first what we're going to see, and we're going to follow that prophetic wind that's going to sweep everything away. But it's the last couple, is it not, that we're looking at, um, which who are Aureliano Babilonia and his wife Amaranta Ursula. You know, one more of these names that we've heard so many times. The only couple we're told that in the whole Buindia line that married for love. And what we're going to see, are we not, is that the terrible curse is accomplished. And the terrible curse that everyone's been worried about is that the baby is born with a pig's tail. But that wouldn't be so bad if it weren't that then he dies, his mother dies, and there is an italicized sentence you will remember very well if you look at the top of page 446 the, and in the uh, older version 381, the first of the line is tied to a tree and the last is being eaten by ants. Well, things have turned decidedly, uh, shall I say, grotesque. The Greek tragic sense of this novel, that prediction of terrible things to come has been accomplished. And Aureliano then wanders around the town looking for a way into the past, we're told. So we have the last, we have the setting, we have the last couple and their last baby, the last Buindia baby. And then what else? The most important thing, which is the deciphering of the manuscripts. How does that go? Anybody want to help us out with this? Brent, could I pick on you? You're very good at the end. Would you push the button, though? Thank you. You're, you're, you've paid close attention, and I really appreciate it. Tell us about this decipherment business. Well, it says that, um, where is it? The even lines were in What page are you on? The same that 446, we... 446. Uh, okay, 446. Uh, okay, towards the bottom, and that's going to be in the older version, 380. Uh, new version. Yeah, that's the new version, but then in the other version, it's 381 as it happens. Yeah. Toward the bottom. Uh huh. So he had written it in Sanskrit, which was his mother tongue, and he had encoded it in even lines in the private, ci the private cipher of the Emperor Augustus, and the odd lines in the, I'm going to try, military code. Um, what else do you want to know? Yeah, yeah, but see, okay, so he's. he's we now understand that these hundred here suddenly the narrator isn't the omniscient narrator we thought but we know now and we'll go back if you read it a second time there are hints that he he's in that room in the buendia house where it's always march and always monday and he's immortalizing the family there are there are hints that he's writing it all down but garcia marquez decides to leave it till the end to show us that it was all already written that he wrote The Hundred Years of Solitude, Melchiades, a hundred years before it happened, if you want. He is the apocalyptic perspective. He sees what was, what will be, what, what has been and what will be. St. John, the <coughs> author of Apocalypse, is constantly speaking about this universalizing vision of before and after all at once. How come? How does he know? Because the end's already happened. The end is predicted. So he can tell you beginning, middle, and end because he stands at a point theoretically beyond the end, as do we readers when the apocalypse, apocalypse comes. And the, so, so there's a very interesting revelation of uh, Melchiades. But, but Brent, what about this business that Aureliano has to hurry because suddenly his time and the textual time? Well, it seems that they both, they trigger each other mutually. Yeah. Uh, it says that um, on the next page, that the reason the Segundos couldn't um, decipher the text wasn't because they didn't want to, but because they tried prematurely. Yeah. Almost like some genetic factor or something in fate wouldn't allow them to get to that end point. Yeah. And so he was the last one who was able to, and when he does, that triggers the apocalypse. Yeah, that's right. And vice versa. Yeah. So that's your point about what causes the apocalypse, that it's a textual matter, that it's not, and I think that's a very interesting point, and it's certainly here on the printed page. That it ends with the deciphering of his text. Yes. The banana yeah. company just kind of happens in the middle, and it has an impact. But okay. if this is apocalyptic, Great. then 
Yeah, well, th see, I think we can use apocalyptic generally, but what you're so right about here is that in the last few pages, it is that time, the real time catches up with textual time, and when that happens, the the world and the text that we're reading, if you want, end. But of course, here we survive with the book still in our hands, so obviously. Um, but this is, not, this is the opposite of that phrase, they lived happily ever after. There's no ever after. There's a huge subversion of that because of why. Okay, well, I guess here's where we will continue to place different emphases on the why. For me, the why is the corruption the violence, the, the capitalist invasion from outside, all of that finally does cause the textual thing that we see at the end. But you're quite right. By the time we're at the end of this book, other than those memories of the child that was held up on, on the shoulders of Jose Arcadio Segundo, we've more or less forgotten the rains. <laughs> we've forgotten. It's just like, it's just now, it's just a little old abandoned town is what, what it is. But thank you so much for, for resituating that discussion because I, I must say, I read this as a highly political novel, but it's also a novel about how history is written. That's what is interesting for me. Did somebody have a hand up, Lynn or Norma? I thought I saw it. Norma, yeah. Would you push your button if you have one? Well, maybe you could borrow Lynn's there. Pass it back. Yeah, thank you. On page 384, um, Melquiades. Okay, 384. Let us get there. Hang on. We're all racing to 384. Whereabouts on the page? The, the second full paragraph? We're about, uh, and are you, you're pushing the right button, Norma? Um, yeah, it's Melquiades yeah. revealed to him. Yeah. Um, that his opportunities to return to the room were limited, but he would go in peace to the meadows of the ultimate death because Aureliana would have time to learn Sanskrit. Sanskrit. During the years remaining until the parchments became 100 years old when they would be deciphered. Yeah, yeah, again, all of this foreshadowing. So you're right, here we... Here, we still don't know exactly that Melchiades has written them, but we pretty much do, because his language is Sanskrit. We're to told that. But why you're pointing this out just to show that we knew that Melchiades was the narrator before the final pages, or what? Well, actually, I don't think he was uh, the narrator. I just, um, to me, it seemed like if he knew that Would you push your button? Oh, <laughs> sorry, it's a bit inconvenient. I'm, I beg your pardon. Um, to me, it seemed like he already knew that he would decipher them because it's saying that he was going to go in peace to finally to his death. Um, so he, he was like, this is going to take place. He already, yeah. he already knew it. Okay, yeah. Yeah, all right, that's, that's fine. I don't, you know, we know that he's been preparing, that he's been working. He's one of those intellectual Aurelianos who spends lots of time alone working on this project. So I guess you're right. We, we, we know they're going to be deciphered. But why don't you think that at the end it's proposed that the text we are reading is the text that was deciphered that was written by Melchiades. It seems to me at the end we're told whether it matters or not. I guess what I'm saying is it seems to me at the end when it is revealed for sure that these are Melchiades manuscripts that Aureliano is, the last Aureliano is deciphering, we have to imagine that the fiction is that we too have been reading the text that's been deciphered, which is the history of the family and so forth. Oh, okay, so you're saying, yes, I, I agree that he, he was the one that wrote the... the yeah, questions. okay, good. Yeah, yeah and then in a, in a sense, this is the text we're reading. Of course, this is a fiction. And of course, if we were really reading the text in the fictional world, we would also be blown off by the prophetic winds. So, but what's interesting to me is why Garcia Marquez leaves this till the end. Why this little twist at the end? Why have Melchiades do this? Well, anybody, anybody have, I mean, and why wait so long? Why not say, well, he went into the room where it's always March and always Monday to record a hundred years of solitude, and so he was taking notes, and you, you know, he wrote in a foreign language, so Aureliano will finally have to decipher them, but why this funny little textual narrative surprise at the end? Does it matter to us? 
in the end that Melchiades is the narrator? Well, you'd, you'd expect one of the characters to survive to tell the story. And so in a way of like having one of the characters tell the story and not explain the narrator, you're, you're kind of leaving yourself short one way or the other. Because yeah. if you have a character do it, then you're, you're already saying this person's going to survive or, or so on and so forth. And if you have, uh, without an explanation of who the narrator is, it takes away some of the realism, even though it's kind of a fantastic explanation of yeah, the novel. That's, that's an interesting point. He wants to say everyone was blown away. Although lots of novels end without anybody, um, you know, realistic novels anyway, end, and we just, because we believe in omniscient narrators, we say, well, we got the story, maybe the story of someone living in the 19th century, and it's not provided for at the end that someone tells the story. But still, you're right, it emphasizes that everything goes. And I, I think Malkides is actually a <laughs> biblical character. I, I remember yeah. reading something about that. I don't have it mm, right yeah. on hand. But then also, that the last line is also like, the first of the line is, is tied to a tree, present tense. And the last of the line, present tense, is being eaten by the ants. So yeah. you have this like, God-like feeling of omnipresence yeah. even through time. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. you know? yeah. No, I, th I think that whole um, seeing it all at once, that simultaneous view, which is very much the apocalyptic point of view. I, you know, God has said what will be the beginning, and you know, I'm Alpha and Omega. Uh, omega. The Omega is, of course, the apocalypse, the beginning and the the end. It, uh, the grapes of wrath, all those marvelous lines that we, we have uh, from the apocalypse, but that, that kind of magnificence of vision, I think Melchiades, by positing a kind of magic narrator outside the, the Buendia family who ha who's died on the shores of Singapore, we've already been told, and comes back to Macondo to die uh, a second death. Anne, were you going to say something along these lines? Um, I don't think my comment's quite so deep. <laughs> I just think that um, since Melchiades came, he died, came back, yeah. lots of people died and came back, um, there's so much fantastic going on. Why couldn't we have someone who knew in the yeah. beginning how it was going to end? Yeah. Among the people there, Wrong. you mean? It, yeah, it doesn't have to I mean, be this odd gypsy figure. It could be anybody because... Why limit? Well, so much yeah. happened. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when you asked, is it important that we know? And I shook my head, no. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, not, it's not important that it was him or anyone else or that we know who wrote it, but, but why not? You know, why not mm -hmm. accept that as just oh, well, part I think of the novel? We, I think we have to accept it. I guess I'm just now trying to analyze it. I, I mean, we're told that it's Melchiades' manuscript. Anybody else? There was another hand around here someplace. Or, yeah, if he, will you push the button, please? Do you think that Melchizedek um, caused the decline of Macondo? Well, that's what we've been discussing for a while here. Um, do you? Why? How? Are you pushing the right button? It's that, I think oh. it's another button there. Sorry. There you go. When he, when he came, that's when. Um, uh, Jose Benito started uh, going in a retreat, retreating in a solitude, and everything started going crazy. He well, that's true. The novel starts with the gypsies and their yeah. fabulous inventions and so forth. Because they bring technology. Yeah, they bring technology. And magic. Uh huh. But still, somehow, I guess I I don't see him as so causal. Anybody want to respond to that, Kathy? Do you have a? Uh, okay, you tell us. I feel that the magic is the only thing that survives. And, um, and how does it survive at the end? Through the survival of the text? Or? Yeah, because yeah. we're holding the book hearing it, and, yeah. and we believe down to the very last line everything that he's writing, whether it's yeah. like, you know, okay, this is a narrator or whoever. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think that matters either. But I, I think that the whole, you know, apocalyptic ending that, that we were asking you to talk yeah. about, you even said, you know, you said, but I, I feel like I don't think you can separate the two. I don't think you can separate, you know, um, the ending with the banana boat company. Banana I mean, hurricane, the, the, ban the banana, banana hur what do we call it? Banana company banana hurricane. Company yeah, hurricane. yeah. I, I, don't, I just think it, I mean, reading the novel, I, I, it's just, 
that's really what I felt caused the demise. Yeah, I yeah. Like it's so political. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's been my reading, but Brent has, has opened my eyes somewhat <laughs> to at least reading the end as a textual event. That's why I think Melchiades is really important. I think it's important to have someone ha who, because what this becomes in the last three pages is not only a novel about Colombia or about a mythical Latin American country, we wouldn't ex mistake it for a European or a Asian country. It's a mythical Latin American country with political abuses abounding and so forth. But in the last three pages, it becomes about how how do you write about that? It, this is a text about a text, and it becomes that only in the last three pages when we see, the, the, for sure, because you're so right, Norma, we see Aureliano, the last Aureliano and others in this process of l trying to decipher these manuscripts. But now what we have at the end is, this is a, a book about Colombian history, and it's a book about the writing of any history. So this kind of meta history or this secondary level I think is given to us by this final decipherment plot. So if you want to say it's a novel who, about the history of Macondo and about the deciphering of the history of Macondo. It's two different things. So I love it when narrators are not invisible. I love visible narrators. I love first person narrators. They'll tell you all sorts of lies and who's to contradict them so we have to, fi to, f to figure that out. Think of Nabokov's Lolita or Despair or the real life of Sebastian Knight. Nabokov is a great genius at the unreliable unre first person narrator. Um, but so I guess for me it's an odd twist at the end that Melchiades is revealed finally, finally to be the, the constructor of the text about the events that we've been, and indeed the constructor, the, the, the maker, the writer of the text we have been reading. That does happen in other, other novels. It happens in Proust. I don't know if you read Proust, the great early 20th century stream of consciousness Marcel, writer, French um, Marcel Proust, but he has seven volumes. I haven't read all seven. Um, but the structure is that it's a young man named Marcel. It happens to be the same name as the author who is telling about his childhood and learning and telling all about his neighbors. And we learn at the very end that this whole process is the process that prepares him to become the writer to write what we've just read. So there, that kind of circular structure isn't un, unknown, and, and I happen to like that at the end. But I guess what I want to do is call attention to Garcia Marquez's, I think, again, political objective at the end, which is to say, um, now this is a fine story here. Um, but how, how do we tell it? How do we know it? Who knows the truth? All of this business about no one knowing the truth of the banana company, company hurricane yet, but we read it. We read it in detail. So, so it raises questions about the textuality, and that's why I like Brent's reading at the end, that somehow we have to pay more attention to that, the way time is closing in on that last buen dia to the moment where the text and the life of the town and at the same time. So it's, it's a kind of neat additional literary detail for me, and it's certainly magical in the sense that um, it's not our usual experience. Of course, when you finish a novel, the world of the novel ends, but usually, I mean, there are apocalyptic endings. How does Moby Dick end? I see, Moby Dick was what made Chris's comment made me think of Moby Dick. Of course, everybody goes down on the the Pequod, except for one who is the fellow who lives to tell the tale. Call me Ishmael. And how does Ishmael survive? Remember, he's in a coffin. There's a coffin floating around, and there he is at the very end. So it is sometimes the case that um, there's an apocalyptic story, but there's one person who remains to tell, to the, tell the tale. Um, so anyway, it's just fun to consider those last 
uh, pages and wonder why Garcia Marquez has complicated them with what seems finally like who cares whether it's Melchiades or any one of the other magical people who comes back, for example, Prudencio Aguilar. But the fact that it's someone and that he makes a, a, a point of that, I think, is, is worth, worth our noting as careful readers of literary structures. It complicates the structure of this book considerably, I think. Comments about that, more about that? There are a couple more passages I just want to loop back to, and maybe you have passages you'd like to loop back to. There's so much in this novel, as I was reading your quizzes and you know, on the question about hyperbole, I just loved reading your answers because everybody had different uh, ideas about, I mean, there's so much hyperbolic nonsense in this, this novel. There's so much more to say about it than we've said. So I guess what I want to ask you is which direction you want to head, or do you want to just look at a few more passages that, so that seem to be, um, to me, to be wonderful? Comments about which way to head? Please read more Garcia Marquez. Um, we are leaving him now. I, do we come back to him? I can't remember at the end of the course. I think we do, don't we? Do we read another? I don't even remember. No, we don't. Ah, it's so sad. Um, <laughs> read Love. If you like this book, you'll love Love in the Time of Cholera. It's his, it's a second novel after this one. came out in about 1982 or 3. I don't have the date. I wrote some of the titles up at the outset. The other book to read after reading this one is his autobiography, where you feel you're rereading this novel, because he tells about the family members who sound a lot like the characters and the activities in this, in this novel. Isabel Allende, as she's the person we're ending with, I forgot, uh, The House of the Spirits also has a brilliant autobiography where you can do the same thing. You read the novel, and if you read the novel, you get to read it again in a real register in her autobiography called Paula, which is the story of her 28-year-old daughter's death. Uh, very sad uh, story, but it's wonderful to read the autobiographical discussion of the people who become the characters in the novel that we've that we've read. So I recommend that you continue with Garcia Marquez as good literature students. You're making your lifelong reading lists where you never possibly get to all of the books, but it's great fun to have them on a list. It's a bit like Netflix, you know, all those all those movies we have to see. There's an it's not kind of comforting to have them on some some list. Put down Love in the Time of Cholera. It's his other great masterpiece in my view, and then his autobiography is perfect, living to tell, living to tell the tale, and that just was translated last year. And I know William has read that you mentioned. Isn't it fabulous? There's a little one down. Oh, there it goes. There, good. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really dense, but it gave so much background into yeah. into this book, and especially what I found was really ironic, and I really remember it was the. Uh, uh, the anniversary of the of the, the man banana farm massacre. Oh, the banana company massacre. The, the, yeah, yeah. And yeah. how and how the actually the government had accepted the number that he gave in the novel. Oh, remember that? Yeah, he he makes that point that he yes that he his version the novelistic version has now become the official version because there was no official version and so the government now says well it's the number that Garcia Marquez says in his novel One Hundred Years of Solitude. I love that, a great exa example of life imitating art uh, rather than the, the opposite. It is very dense, that book, and you may want to um, throw in the towel about two-thirds of the way through because he, uh, the man has never forgotten a name and never forgotten a place. <laughs> and uh, it's just uh, amazing. He tells about one of his aunts, for example, who went blind. And when Ursula goes blind, remember, we're told that she could tell, that, tell where she was by where the shadows fell and what time of day it was. Um, and he says, I had an aunt, my aunt was just like that, that she went blind, but she, she continued to operate perfectly. So that element of Ursula comes into uh, that element of, from that ant, the blindness comes into the character of Ursula. But do you remember William, William what he says, and this is the punchline of that long paragraph where he describes this ant so brilliantly. Maybe I'll have to bring my book in. Um, he says, my, my, but 
I remember her perfectly. I remember how she navigated according to the to the temperature and the shadows uh, of the sh of the shade. He says, and my mother swears that she died before I was two years old. Remember that? And I said, well, that's genius. <laughs> he says, I remember it. And I, he, my mother says she died before I was two. So anyway, one one loves these details, and and uh, at least I did, and maybe you all will too. Yeah. I just want to. Yeah. About um, Melchides. Yeah. I just think it's really important that Melchides isn't part of their culture. Like he comes from somewhere else. Okay. And what we were talking about in the history class that previous semester yeah. is that so much Latin American history, especially, was destroyed. I mean, when yeah. they, they was burned, it was yeah. thrown into the water. It was yeah. just disappeared. And like. Um, the Buendias kind of represent um, memory, mm -hmm. which can be forgotten. Like the only two survivors who witness it are Buendias. Um, yet someone who wasn't there, in Malchides, who represents like the real history, yeah. is there to say, well, it did happen. I mean, it, yeah. they might, it might, like memory might be subjective, but history isn't, it's objective. And uh, that he, because he writes it, and because he's not part of the memory, he's part of the history, yeah. that um, no matter if these things are lost or thrown away or people try to destroy them, that the truth prevails. Yeah, yeah I think through. that's a very nice point. Thank you. I remember that we talked about Melchiades' status as an outsider. Who else is an outsider? There are two or three people who go into Macondo. Pietro Crespi comes. But basically, and the Catalan bookstore owner is from Catalonia, obviously in Spain. But it is true that he is, Melchiades is such an outsider. And it's not to say that the insiders can't write their own history, but there's something here, again, that metatextual level, which suggests that um, there is the possibility of recording and remembering even in a culture with an insomnia plague, for example. So, so I thank you very much for that point. Oh, I think yeah, exactly. That's why he comes in and he helps cure the insomnia plague. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? History comes back in. Yeah, right, then, right. Yes, yeah, yeah. so we could play. And as I've said, you know, and as you will have noticed, there, there's so much talk about time. I was going to point to some of the passages we still could of Ursula. Ursula keeps saying, oh, time doesn't operate like it used to be. Time now plays tricks, just like she says, just like the Turks when they sell you a yard of percale. In other words, you, you don't know quite how much you've got or how much you're getting. So, so there's a great deal of, um, let's say, consideration of the historicity and temporality of this town, both in textual and experiential terms, not to overcomplicate the point. But thank you. That I'm glad you raised that. Yeah, Ruth? I had a question um, about the book, towards the end of the book, when um, um, Amarante Ursula dies. Yeah. Um, it's probably one of the two or three places in the book that I feel like I was um, really emotionally engaged. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, and it was, you know, all these other people die, and mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's not, it's like, it doesn't, yeah. it, it doesn't yeah. affect me, but for yeah. some reason her death, or maybe the way it was told really affected me and engaged yeah, me Yeah, thank you very much. I was rereading the ending for this class, and I also was very affected by it. It's an affective, it, partly, be, and we don't know her any better than we know any of the other right. characters. But the way it's described, and the fact that the couple is in love, because yeah. all, they're the only couple that aren't absolutely they're, they're a couple rather than solitary cells. So, yeah. so I totally agree with that. It's a very beautiful passage. She, she dies of childbirth, of course. I mean, ble bleeding until. You want to look at her? Heather, did you have a point about this? I just had the same yeah. Thing that, that it affected me because they were in love. And yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Um, look at it just, uh, just since we're all still here at the final pages of the book. What page do you have? Do you have it? 443. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Just just read that. It's t it's a terrible paragraph. Um, but start, would you, Ruth? She, she took the frightened Aureliano, but no, just read the whole thing. They have their, their child with the tail of a pig, or a, a pigtail, as someone put it. That's a different thing. Tail of a pig is one thing, and pigtail is another. Um, the, the, just so they have their baby, but they were not alarmed. Just read that paragraph, will you, Ruth, for us? 
They were not alarmed. Aureliano and Amaranta Ursula were not aware of the family precedent, nor did they remember Ursula's frightening Ad admonitions. admonitions, and the midwife pacified them with the idea that the tail could be cut off when the child got his second teeth. Then they had no time to think about it again because Amaranta Ursula was bleeding in an uncon uncontainable tor torrent. Torrent, they, yeah. They tried to help her with applications of spider webs and balls of ash, but it was like trying to hold back a spring with one's hand. During the first hour, she tried to maintain her good humor. She took the frightened Aureliano by the hand and begged him not to worry because people like her were made were not made to die against their will, and she exploded with laughter at the ferocious remedies of the midwife. But as Arleano's hope abandoned him, she was becoming less visible, as if the light on her were fading away until she sank into drowsiness. At dawn on Monday, they brought a woman who recited catarizing prayers that were infallible for man and beast beside her bed, but Amarantha Ursula's passionate blood was insensible to any art artifice that did not come from love. In the afternoon, after 24 hours of desperation, they knew that she was dead because they, the flow had stopped without, without remedies and her profile became sharp and the blotches on her face evaporated in a halo of alabaster and she smiled again. Ah, it's very sad, isn't it? But what a beautiful job at that last yeah. half sentence. She becomes beautiful in, in death. Yeah, very, very moving, yeah, sad. Um, but but I, I'm taking your, your observation here to suggest what you said, I think, a couple of times ago, which is that this is basically a novel about community rather than psychology. Right. We don't, right. and yet we're moved. We're moved and we're interested. To me, it's, it's a, a great magician's trick that Garcia Marquez himself has done, that we, d we have so little sense of the inner lives of these characters at the same time that we care to continue reading. Yeah. And it's not that the novel is so plotted like an Agatha Christie either. For me, what keeps me reading is the beauty of the sentences, really. Right. Uh, I mean, that, that passage you just read, that final sentence, I mean, it's just so beautiful. The, the language, the pace, and it's a translation. We have to re keep remembering how lucky we are to have had Gregory Rabassa. Edith Grossman is the one who tra translates Love in the Time of Cholera, by the way, when it was announced that Gregory Rabassa would no, long would not, would no longer be Garcia Marquez's translator. Everybody, was, uh, was, uh, everybody who pays attention to those things uh, was upset. Myself, I was quite <coughs> upset. I said, oh, no. Edith Grossman does an equally good job with Love in the Time of Cholera. It's beautifully translated. Yeah. Megan. Um, I was just going to say it's also, to me, it's, it's interesting how quickly um, Aureliana was cut off from her after uh, her death because it doesn't say that he put the baby in the basket and covered her face mm -hmm. or yeah. looked at her and covered he covered the corpses yeah. face. Yeah. It doesn't, yeah. you know, And see, that's where we, we come right back away from the, from the, from the psycholo psychological novel. If this were a psychological novel, we'd have to have at least a paragraph of, for the grieving husband, after all. And we'd have to see to the preparation of the bodies. But this isn't a realistic novel. It's a magical realistic novel. So we're moved by the death at the same time. I think I've told you I'm going to point out a chicken that rolls off a tray and under the table and is never picked up in, in um, House of the Spirits. In a realistic novel, you have to pick up the chicken and wash it off or cook something else. or do So, you, so, so th that's an interesting point that you've made. It, it, it I think, reinforces what we're, we're, we're saying, that it, it is odd that the husband is, <coughs> you know, is not... Um, psychologically depicted at that point. At this point, he's trying to, skipping pages to keep up with how fast time is catching up with him and the end of, of the story. Other comments about passages? Yeah, Lynn, what would you like to say to us? Well, I was just curious about um, what it might have been like or wh how the experience differed in reading the Spanish version versus the English version. Ah, well, Norma's would you mind passing the microphone? Norma can tell us just now because she was reading the Spanish for a while and then she decided to read in English if that's not, if I'm yes. not mistaken. I started reading the Spanish version and um, 
Well, Spanish is my first language, but there's a lot of words I didn't understand, and it was taking me a long time to look at the definition. So it was hard for me. So I switched to English. But the and are you finding the English as satisfying as reading it in Spanish? Well, Norma came and asked me if, how much I thought she'd lose, and I said, you know, given time constraints, obviously it's perfect to read it in Spanish and look up all the words and underline and really get into that Colombian. Uh, vocabulary, but limited time. I said I didn't think she'd lose a thing. I, I, has that been the case? Well, I, I would have liked to have read it in Spanish, but it was a little frustrating going to the dictionary and yeah, looking at yeah. the words. But I thought the English version was great. Uh, the only thing I did like about the Spanish one is that it had a lot of footnotes, yeah. and it explained a lot about the book. Like, for example, his grandmother w did marry her first cousin, yeah. and his... Um, sister did eat dirt like um, Rebecca uh, yeah Rebecca yeah so it was really interesting to see some of the things and it also talks about some of the historical things and yeah uh, the coronel was really based on Urbide Urbide and yeah it, it was really interesting right in that yeah. sense yeah thank you um see for it, your is it would have to be that Norma and I would have different answers maybe Lynn to the question now, now, William, are you fluent in Spanish? Have you read it? In, no, I think I asked you that. Yeah. yeah I don't know. For for me, reading it in Spanish makes it more exotic yet because my native language is English. So, it, I I prefer reading it in Spanish, but and and I oftentimes have both beside me. There were a couple places if, uh, where I, I thought there were odd little translations. I couldn't quite see the Spanish behind the English where I'll go check. But I mean, I love reading it in Spanish because for me, it, make, it takes me back to Colombia. It's, it's one, as you will when you read in a, a foreign language, there's something about the atmosphere that the language itself conveys that in English, but I still think it's, a, it's really, a great translation. I just don't think you lose much in translation. Now, Megan has pointed out that we're going to be reading um, some short stories that are up on the on our Vista website. One of which is by Julio Cortázar, an Argentine writer whom I love, a great short story writer. And we're going to be reading this little three-page short story of his. And Megan was um, distressed by the flatness of the English when compared to the Spanish because you've just lately read the same story in Spanish. And I ha wouldn't have said that. I'm going to pay attention now that you've said it to see how much I think is lost in translation. Um, who reads in a foreign language regularly novels? Anybody? Yeah, what do you read in, Kim? Uh, I'm majoring in Spanish, so I mean, I'm taking Latin American literature classes and everything. Yeah, right now, so. yeah, yeah. It, do you find the same to be true that I've noted that in reading in Spanish is partly just the process of being in a world that isn't your own, even as, as well as you may speak it. It's that, that's that's enriching. Right. Yeah. I yeah. I agree with you on that point. It is more exotic, and then just seeing because the language is, I think, more maybe figurative sometimes in, in Spanish, so yeah. you get that. I, I think it's yeah. a little more enriching. Yeah, yeah. No, almost any translation of a Spanish text into English will be shorter than the Spanish text. English is an economical language. It's much more... It, so even a good translation where you don't think you lose much, it's going to tend to be shorter. So, um, yeah, there's something about Spanish that is florid, and I mean, there's a reason why English is the language of business, the language of computation. It's we're we're economical, we're practical. When I write my friends in Mexico in on the internet, I um, of course put in a nice reading and a nice despedida. I mean, instead of just saying what I'm going to say, one is more. There there are more um, rules of. For, or more formalities, which I happen to love, actually. I mean, I like those formalities. Okay, I'm going to let you go. Um, we start reading Borges. Would you please read, if you can anyway, the stories it's assigned in labyrinths, in labyrinths. There are other translations, as William has just reminded me, including the new volume of the collected short stories. I prefer that we use labyrinths if you have a choice, if you already have the, collect the new translation by Andrew Hurley, we'll get to compare translations anyway. So, um, Borges, 
has been variously translated. See you Tuesday. Bye.